Okay, great. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited to talk to some fellow nature enthusiasts. As you heard, my name is Jessica. I am a volunteer with the Mammals of Maine. I've been volunteering with them since 2017. I started out, um, so I have a history, the last 20 years of my career has been wildlife education at different wildlife centers and outdoor education centers around the country, um, working with wildlife and talking about them. Those are my two passions. So I get to work with wildlife and I get to talk about them. It's amazing. So I've been doing that for 20 years. I am now a little bit more behind the scenes running social media accounts for different wildlife organizations. Um, and when I got involved with Marine Mammals of Maine, they were looking to expand their outreach and education. And that was what I did. So I was so excited that I get to go talk about marine mammals. Now, I also started working with their animal care team at the center. So actually taking care of the animals that come into our uh, seal hospital, we'll call it. Um, and then I quickly joined the response team as well. So I will be dispatched on calls to go assess situations with different animals on the beach. Um, and so I kind of I infiltrated the whole organization. Um, so if you have any questions about any of it at all, as we go, feel free to shout out any questions. I'm going to be telling you a lot about the organization and about seals in general and marine mammals we'll touch on briefly, but we're going to focus on the seals because these are the animals that are coming into our center. So this is all about a seal's journey from rescue to release. Now we are marine mammals of Maine, and I'm gonna say that so many times tonight, it's a bit of a mouthful, I'm gonna shorten it. So we shorten it to M-M-O-M-E, -E, which also seems like a mouthful. But if you look at M-M-O-M-E, -E, it looks like it spells mommy. So if you hear me say mommy, this is what I'm talking about. And it works out so well because then you can tell people if you're on the beach and you see a seal or any other marine life, Call mommy, that's us. So it's easy to remember, call mommy. Uh, so if you hear me say that, that's what it's about. So Marine Mammals of Maine was started in 2011 and we were permitted in 2012 to respond to marine animals up and down the coast. We worked closely with UNE. They had, um, if anyone's familiar, they had the MARC Center, Marine Animal Rescue Center. And we would be the response that would bring these animals to that center to receive their care. And we would bring 70 to 80 animals throughout the year to that center. In 2014, UNE abruptly shut down the Mark Center with, with no warning at all. And the busiest weekend of the year, which is Memorial Weekend. So we had our team um, responding to SEALs and nowhere to take them. So we quickly started working with some different centers in Massachusetts and Connecticut to transport these animals to those centers since those were the closest ones. Now, as you can imagine, when you're not feeling well, the last thing you wanna do is go on a road trip. <laughs> so the seals didn't always survive that transport. So Linda Doughty, she was our founder and still our executive director. She knew that we had to fill that void that was now open from the Mark Center closing. So in 2016, she received triage permitting from NOAA Fisheries. They're our overarching permitting body. She received triage permitting. That meant that we were the first and only triage center on the East Coast for marine mammals. What that means to triage is we were given four days to stabilize the animal in order for them to feel better to be able to do that transport out of state. And then we were seeing the success rate raise exponentially in the seal surviving that transport. So we were able to triage um, for four days. Now that wasn't good enough. We had to bring marine mammal rehabilitation back to Maine so in 2017, we were granted permitting to do long-term care. So now we could keep the animals as long as they needed. But with any other wildlife rescue, permitting limits how many animals we can take in. So we have grown a lot in our little bit of time since getting our permitting. And in 2022 became the largest 
seal pup rescue center on the East Coast. We are now the ones that can take the most when we started out as the smallest. Um, we also get the most response calls here in Maine. As Bill mentioned, our coastline is huge. So we get the most calls. We could fill all of the centers on the East Coast with animals from Maine. Um, so now we're able to prioritize the animals from our region and keep them long-term as long as they need care. Now, the ultimate goal, of course, is to release these animals. And I'm going to go into all that as we go here. So, okay, now these are the four pillars of what we do. We do response. We run a 24-7 hotline where people can report any animals on the beach, and we will send a trained volunteer, staff, or intern to take a look at that animal. So we do a lot of response. We also provide care to the ones that need it. We also collect a lot of data. Um, if you come across a deceased animal on the beach, we wanna know about that too. We're gonna collect some data to keep track of any patterns that might start up or just to keep an eye on the health of the populations of these animals up and down the coast. And of course we do education. We are finding that a lot of our cases are human interaction, well-intended humans that maybe did the wrong thing and made the situation a bit worse. So we wanna spread education and how to interact with these animals. And mostly it's how to not interact with these animals. Um, and we'll get into all that. So we do a lot of education and this is the kickoff to our summer education series. So I'm really excited. Um, to get going with talking to people all uh, up and down the coast throughout Maine. Now, um, you're seeing some pictures here of some people. Uh, we have five full-time staff that has grown as we've grown as well. We have a few seasonal staff and part-time staff. We do have some summer interns we wouldn't be able to get through without them. Mm -hmm. And we also have about 50 volunteers who are mostly responsible for responding. Um, we have people strategically placed up and down the coast, hoping that we can send someone pretty close to that animal so that um, the situation isn't uh, getting worse in the time it takes us to get there. Now with response, we never know what our day is gonna look like when we get a call for a seal. They might be um, finding marine patrol to take us out to an island and rescue a seal pup out on an island. It might be um, pushing them on a sled through the snow, uh, one of the easier ways to get them out. This um, picture in the snow, this was at Reed State Park, and this seal ended up into the woods of the park. So it was quite the adventure tracking it down, and then a long way to take it back because they never strand in a convenient place. <laughs> Um, so this is what our day-to-day -day could look like in our response um, zone. So where are we doing this? And you heard from Bill, we cover from Kittery to Rockland. So 2,500 miles of the main coast. Uh, the rest of the coast is covered by our partners at Allied Whale, which is through the College of the Atlantic. Now they are a response organization if they bring in an animal that needs care, it comes to us. We're the only center in Maine that's able to provide that care to marine mammal and sea turtles, which I'll get into. I know that's not a mammal, but we'll get into it. Uh, so we respond to 300 to 400 marine animals every year, and we get thousands of phone calls. Um, sometimes one animal might equal 20 phone calls throughout the day. Um, so we have a staff that is strictly uh, on the telephone all the time. So these are the animals that we're responding to the most, a group of animals called pinnipeds. Pinniped means winged or flipper footed. So these are seals, walruses, sea lions. Those are all animals with uh, flipper feet. Of course, not all of them live in our region. I have on the bottom here some graphics of a true seal versus a sea lion. In Maine, we only have true seals. Now, is, is anyone noticing some differences between the two? Body shape a little bit. Ears. External ears, thank you. Yeah, so we have true seals and we have eared seals or sea lions. Eared seals or sea lions have outer ear flaps like we do. True seals like we have are just like in the picture, they just have a little hole. 
um, as their ear. Also, sea lions can use their back flippers to kind of bring them up and waddle around on the rocks. Uh, our seals can't do that. Our seals back flippers are pretty small and they're most functional in the water. So when they're on land, they're not quite as graceful as they are in the water, but they can move around just fine. Um, it's a good thing they have some blubber on their bodies. They do a belly bounce around on the rocks. It's actually called glumphing, kind of the sound it looks like it's making, glump, glump, glump. <laughs> uh, so they do a little belly bounce. I just added this picture in here because this is what our center looks like right now. These are three of the babies that are at our center. And I can tell you all about why they came in um, in just a bit. But these are the animals we're responding to the most. And we only have true seals here, not sea lions. So these two are harbor seal pups. And I wanted to point out some of their adaptations here. They have really big eyes. Now, usually in the animal world, big eyes means they can see better, especially in murky water. So they have great eyesight. Uh, their nose here, their nose is actually designed at rest. The nostrils are closed and they use muscles to open them to breathe so that they don't get water up their nose. If anyone's experienced that, it's not fun feeling. So they're able to protect themselves from getting water up the nose. And also this one is just really showing off its whiskers here. They have incredible whiskers. They're eight times more sensitive than a cat's. So they feel a lot of movement. That helps them in the murky water to feel fish moving around. Uh, there is a seal off the coast of Rockland that something happened to it and it's lost all of its eyesight, but he survived just fine using his whiskers for hunting. He's one of the chubbiest in the harbor. And that's a good thing. We love a chubby seal. That's, that's healthy. So we have four seal species here in Maine. Two of them are here year round and two of them are here seasonally. So we're gonna do a little um, quiz here. Does anyone know one of the types of seals that lives here in Maine? Harbor seals, yes. What else? What's that? Gray seals, yes. Anything else? Harp seals, yes. There's one more that's pretty elusive. It's not here too often. I will say, I think we've only had one in our 12 years of existing. Um, Hooded seal. Yeah, great job. Now, not all of those are here all year. Two of them are here year round and two of them are seasonal visitors. So first of all, we have the harbor seals. If you've seen a seal on the beach, it's probably a harbor seal. They're the most common, the most populated around here. Um, and they are known for coming up on the beaches quite often. Um, and they are born in May and June. So it's right now pupping season for these guys. And it's actually getting to be about the time where the babies are weaning from their mom. So harbor seals stay with their mom for about a month and then they're off on their own and they get a very rude awakening <laughs> of what, what life in the ocean is like. Um, it's just kind of cold turkey. They're just separated from mom. So these are the harbor seals. You're going to see probably more harbor seals in this presentation than anything else because it's the species we respond to the most. But we also get gray seals. These are here year round as well. These ones are born December through February and they're born on some islands off the coast. So we don't usually see these ones as often like on the beach. Um, out if you go out off shore, you might see them swimming around islands. Um, but these pups, since they're born in the wintertime, they are born with a fluffy white coat called lanugo fur. Uh, that's to help keep them warm while mom is off fishing and they are left on their own for a little bit. Our harbor seals do have that fur as well, but since they don't really need it being born in the summer, they shed that in utero usually. Um, we've had a few that were born with it, but usually it's gone before um, they are born. Now, if you're familiar, if you will follow along with marine mammals in Maine at all, you have probably heard of these two, Dexy and Sunshine. These two, so we don't normally name the seals. They get a number. So this was number four and number six of the year. Every year we start over. Now, these two came from Cape Elizabeth, and 
Dexy uh, was the one that, um, if you saw in the news, he was wandering around on the road in the middle of the night and a plow truck found him. Not the place for a seal. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was taken back to the water multiple times and he kept reappearing in the road. So we brought him into the center. And then Sunshine was rescued by one of our volunteers, Terry, who's actually watching through Zoom right now. Hi, Terry. Um, and I'm going to talk more about her and what this seal uh, inspired in her. Uh, but Sunshine was the, uh, Dexie's pool mate. These two were both from Cape Elizabeth. And I wanted to show this picture because I really love how you can tell the difference between the girls and the boys here. They do have sexual dimorphism in the gray seals. The girls tend to be a little bit more silvery and the boys are darker. Boys also look like they need to grow into their features a little bit. Um, they're a little bit derpy, I think, when they're babies. Um, that's mostly because these are going to be the biggest seals we have here. They can reach 500 to 700 pounds. Um, so they're, they're going to be pretty big, the boys especially. Now, one distinguishing feature of a gray seal is that long snout. So if you're seeing just the head of a seal pop up in the water, you want to look at that snout. If it's a long, horse-shaped face, it's a gray seal. And then the harbor seals have more like a little puppy face. Now we also get the harp seals, as someone pointed out. Um, harp seals are seasonal here. So these animals are born in the Arctic. I call them the National Geographic seal because they're the ones that grace all the covers of National Geographic. They're the white fluffy baby seals. Has anyone ever seen one of those? <laughs> yeah, so these are the harp seals. They're born in the Arctic. They are born um, in the, on the ice and snow. They have that white fluffy fur to keep them warm. Now they look a little different in these two pictures because the bottom picture is a juvenile, so probably a year or two old. The top one is an adult. So their coloring changes a bit, which is different from the other seals as well. Um, a harbor seal, the pattern you see on it as a baby is the pattern you're gonna see on it as an adult. The harp seal, not so much. They do change and when they're juveniles, which we see the most of here, um, they look like harbor seals a bit. The, the adults are white with a dark face and that dark harp shaped design on their back, or at least, described as a harp shape, which is how they get their name. Um, might not be true for all cases, but that is their pattern. Now these animals show up in the winter time and they are accustomed to eating ice and snow to stay hydrated. Now, one thing about these animals is if they are approached on the beach, they may not seem like they are stressed out, um, but they're like some of us humans that are really great at internalizing stress and not showing it outwardly until it's too late. Um, so these animals, when something approaches them, they start to stress and they will start to eat things around them. They are looking for ice and snow to eat. And we may not have all, a lot of that in the winter time when they're here, especially on our beaches. So they might turn to eating sand and rocks, whatever's nearby. And as you can imagine, it's not really great for them to be eating rocks. Um, so even though we don't see it outwardly, they are stressed out by a presence around them. Um, and I'll get into how far legally we're supposed to stay and all of that, but just know like um, waving of the front flipper doesn't equal like, hello, <laughs> like we would think um, with a human waving, uh, that's usually a warning that you're getting a little too close for comfort. But they do have these signs that as volunteers, when we show up to assess a situation, we're looking for these things. We're going to look for sand around the mouth, um, or is it actually eating things? Um, we had one seal, harp seal, come in that had been ingesting rocks because so many people approached it for a photo. And it turns into, like everyone says, I just got close for a minute. But if all of us in the room just got close for a minute, that's a lot of minutes. So this animal ended up ingesting five pounds of rocks. Um, and when he came in, we try everything to get them to naturally pass those rocks. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to do that. So our last resort is operated to remove those rocks. 
Now, um, anesthesia is a tough thing on seals. It triggers their dive response and causes them to hold their breath. So we don't do that if we don't have to. That's last ditch effort to get those rocks out. Um, so we did an operation on the seal and unfortunately he still didn't survive. Um, so just because we're not seeing the whole picture um, doesn't mean like getting too close to it isn't stressing it or just because we're not seeing anyone else get close to it. That doesn't mean 50 people hadn't been close to it throughout the day. Um, so they are really great at masking their issues. And if anyone has a pet, you know that to be true too. We usually don't notice something's wrong until, you know, it's down the line a little bit. And then of course, the hooded seals. These are the ones that I said are a bit more elusive. They're not quite as common. We've only had one or two in our time. The top picture is the juvenile. I call these the alien seals. They just have big eyes for a small face. And then when they were adults, they have that darker face, almost like they have a hood. Um, and then the males have um, a nose balloon. That's how they attract their females. They blow up this big nose balloon in their nose. So um, <laughs> that's interesting. But um, these guys have the shortest nursing period of any mammals. They are only with their mom for three to five days, and then they're on their own. They are born with teeth, so that might be part of it. <laughs> Um, so they they don't stick around with mom too long, and then they are the most aggressive from what I've heard, and that's probably because they're on their own right away. They have to protect themselves. Now, we also get calls for cetaceans, which are whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and we are going to respond to these animals. Seals, on one hand, are semi-aquatic. They come out of the water quite often. Um, I read somewhere, I think like 70% of their time is spent out of the water or at the surface. So these guys, it's not uncommon to see the seals out. But a whale or a dolphin or a porpoise, on the other hand, should not be out taking a nap on the beach. These animals usually get calls for when they're deceased already or, you know, they're about to uh, pass away. So we have had one rescue of a porpoise in our early days. Uh, he was named Noodle because they would use pool noodles to help float him, to let him rest. Uh, he was in the shallow water and he was small enough that he could be rescued. And he was taken to a center in New York that had a pool big enough for him. And I think he spent six or eight months in care. Um, and then he was successfully released back into the ocean. So that's our one um, cetacean rescue and uh, release story. But that one porpoise cost over 80 grand to rehabilitate. And that's the problem with um, the work that we do. These animals have special needs and special diets um, and medical needs. So it does take a lot of resources. Usually one seal pup will be from anywhere between 6,000, 8,000, now probably closer to 10,000 a piece. Uh, so there, it takes a lot of resources, a lot of funding, um, but we do take calls for the cetaceans. We also are the only organization permitted to uh, respond to sea turtles. I think allied whale may be too, but I don't think they get the calls that we do we may get a handful of calls for sea turtles every year. Now we're probably not gonna see them on the beach unless they're deceased. I don't know if anyone saw last summer, there were two large leatherbacks that washed ashore that we responded to and collected data from. The two species that we see the most off the coast here are leatherbacks and loggerheads. Those are the two largest in the world. A leatherback, it's shaped like the one in the bottom. Um, if you put a tape measure at the beginning of the shell behind the head and measured down to the tail, they can be six feet long. They're massive, massive animals. Now they hop into the Gulf Stream to come up here. Uh, they follow the warmer water and the jellyfish. They're designed to eat jellyfish. It's kind of like in Finding Nemo where they're bringing that fast <laughs> water up the coast. That's the Gulf Stream. And then usually, they, you know, get their fill of jellyfish and then they head back down. There are other states like Massachusetts who might see cold stunts green sea turtles as we're approaching fall and winter. We haven't started to see that yet, but maybe as the world is warming, we might. 
So there are organizations in Massachusetts that help to rescue cold stung sea turtles and um, get them feeling better. Then what I think is really cool is the way they get them back to warmer waters is there is a nonprofit organization that's called Turtles Fly 2. It's an airplane that will pick them up and take them to warmer waters. Like what a cool job, how do you get that? Oh, it's awesome. So if what should you do if you do find a stranded marine mammal? There is a law called the Marine Mammal Protection Act that NOAA enacted in 1972. And that law says you are to stay 150 feet from all marine mammals. Now, if their status is critically endangered, it might be even further, but on average for seals, it's 150 feet. Now that's four school buses, it's pretty far. Um, I usually say if the seal is aware of you or you being there is changing its behavior, then you're too close. Or I do the thumb uh, rule so that if I can close one eye and cover up the seal with my thumb, I know that I'm far enough away. If I can't, then I need to back up. But really it's paying attention to, is it noticing you? Is it watching you? Is it moving away? Is it trying to go back to the water? Those clues say you're too close. Um, but anything closer is technically considered harassment. So this says know your do's and don'ts. I'm gonna read you a few things. And I just want you to tell me if you think this is something you should do and you should not do. And this is just for funsies. Um, if you think like, oh, wow, that's um, pretty obvious. Uh, just know that they happen. So we have to include them. Um, should you return it to the water? No. Nope, that animal, like I said, seals are semi-aquatic. That animal is choosing to get out. It may need to rest. It may need to warm up, especially if it's young. It's working really hard to learn to take care of itself and really needs its space to rest. And it's out of the water for a reason. Should you pour water on the animal? Again, no, this might change um, their body temperature, which they may already have trouble regulating if they're not feeling good. Should you handle the animal? That means you're already way too close, right? If you're able to pick up the animal. But um, seals can share germs, so and they do have sharp teeth, so um, they might look cute and cuddly, but I promise you they're not. Should you cover them with blankets? This is a really great question because um, seals, they do have fur, it's pretty thin, and I actually have a pelt with me I can put out um, at the end if you wanna feel what their fur feels like. Their fur is thin. I don't know why that popped up, sorry about that. Um, their fur is thin so that it mostly protects them from sunburn and doesn't really keep them warm. That's what their blubber is for. But things like a porpoise that might end up out of the water, they don't have that fur. Um, but it's up to the response team and how they resolve that issue. So you should never cover it with blankets. Should you remove it from the water? No. So these animals are really graceful in the water. They're great swimmers. They're designed for it. We are not so graceful in the water. Um, so it, if I show up to a call that I've received, and the seal is in the water, there is nothing I can do about it unless it comes out. It's not safe to go in and try to pull a seal out of the water. And if it's choosing to kind of go off on its own, maybe that's what's best for it. So we never remove them from the water or push them back in. Um, keep people and dogs out of sight of the animal. Yeah, yeah, um, seals can share germs with dogs. They actually have a distant cousin. So they can share some of the same diseases and it's just best to not stress either animal. This one, of course, teach others what to do. I can talk to all of you, but if each of you tell one person a do or don't about seals, um, more people will know. Call mommy right away. Yeah, yep, give us a call. And I will um, pass out some things that have our phone number on it, or I'll put it on the screen. So if you wanna put it in your phone so you have it, that'd be great. Keep the area quiet and minimize contact. Of course, we don't need anyone fighting anyone on the beach. Like we'll show up and we'll handle anyone that might not be respecting the space that seals need. We don't expect you to, you know, be um, uh, security for that seal. Um, this was the one you might think is well duh. 
Should you offer snacks or water or drinks to the seal? I can promise you that hot dogs don't grow in the ocean. That's not something a seal is going to eat. Um, they, they don't drink Pepsi. So, and this is true. I worked in animal rescue for a long time and this is true of every single wild animal. The last thing you should ever do is offer uh, an animal food because if you don't know what it's dealing with, that can really mess up their system. And if you think about it, when you're sick, the most important thing is fluids and staying hydrated. That's the same thing for them. But each animal drinks a little differently. You don't want it to go down the wrong pipe. So just, we don't want to make anything worse. And if we don't know what they're dealing with yet, we don't want to mess anything up. So we're not feeding or um, giving drinks to the animals until we know what's going on. And then the first course of action is hydrating that animal, even before we consider any nutrition. So our ultimate goal is to respond to the animals that are stranded. Stranded means they are injured or are in need of help. Not every animal on the beach is stranded. Some of them are taking a nap and we're interrupting them. Um, so we are responding and rescuing the ones that need intervention. Now, pups come in due to maternal abandonment pretty often in the summer. That's because seal moms, they need to go out and get their food, but a baby can't be in the water for too long because they have not yet built up their blubber, so they can't stay warm in that water yet. So mom finds a place on the beach or on the rocks, and she says, you stay right here. And they listen. They do. They listen. They stay right where they're put. And then mom goes out and gets what she needs, and she comes back. Now, us humans loving baby animals so much, we see a baby on its own and we think, oh my God, it can't be on its own. But they can. Like, we might be one of the only species that does not leave our um, babies alone for a long period of time. And sometimes it's the safest for the baby not to have the mom around attracting predators or anything like that. Um, so a baby on its own does not mean it's in trouble. It just means it's waiting for mom. But the problems come in with if a baby is left on a busy beach in the morning when there's no one there, but then all of a sudden the beach is full of hundreds of tourists in the summer. Um, if the mom pops up to come back and sees all those predators, that's scary. She's going to leave. Her fight or flight kicks in and she leaves. And now that baby who needs its mom's milk is left alone. So if we respond to a baby, we normally, depending on the situation, will leave it 24 hours to give mom a chance to come back because their best chance of survival is with their moms. We don't want to intervene if we don't have to. But then after that time frame, that baby needs hydration, and that's when we're going to bring it in. Um, sometimes if it's on a busy beach and this baby's never going to be left alone, we might make that call sooner. So that is what maternal abandonment looks like, is mom is too afraid to come back because people are getting too close, or if they move the baby and then mom can't find it. Um, if we respond to a seal who's on its own and older, and it's on a busy beach, we may relocate it, but we can't relocate a baby because mom knows exactly where she left it. So again, our ultimate goal is to just intervene if we have to, rescue, care for, and release this animal back to its ocean home. Now, sometimes we respond to these animals and they're fine, they're just taking a nap. So we may put up a sign and then keep a volunteer nearby that, you know, the sign says resting seal, lets people know right away, like this seal is fine, it just needs its space. And then we have, we take turns monitoring this baby to make sure it's reunited with mom and people are giving it its space. If I show up to a call and I am assessing this situation, one thing I'm looking at is, is that baby watching me? Is it paying attention to me? Is it lifting its head? Does it have hydration rings? If you notice this pup looks like it has wet rings around its eyes. That tells me that this baby may have fed recently from mom and may have nursed. So this baby is still hydrated. 
So there's a good chance that mom's going to come back for this one um, and that mom hasn't been gone too long. So we want to give them a chance for reuniting. Now, sometimes these little babies blend right in with the rocks and it takes some time to find them. And sometimes that works out. Um, then other people aren't finding them on the beach and they're getting their space. I did go on one call recently in um, Owl's Head, uh, way north, and this seal had been right in the middle of this beach. It's a small beach, and there were people all around. When I went and found it, it was hiding behind a big rock. No one knew it was there. <laughs> I was like, good job. Like, that's great. No one, no one noticed you. Now, if they do need our help and come into care, there's different things that we may do uh, for the care of this patient, depending on what they're fighting. They may have a respiratory infection. Um, they may have uh, some injuries we have to look at. Now this, uh, this one sticking its face out of the window here, this one had a respiratory infection. And so we do something called nebulizers, which us humans can do too. So this little guy was in an incubator and it's getting the medicine um, pumped right into its incubator to breathe in and start to feel a little bit better. Now, when they come in too, they, they are too, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. They are too fed. Now that is the quickest way to get them their fluids and potentially medication. So what we do is we have the seal and it's, this one is not anatomically correct, but you get the idea. You put the side flipper down and right where it meets um, its side here, that's where the belly is. So that's how long the tube has to be. So we're gonna slide the tube in that far. We do some checks to make sure it's brought down the right tube and then we tube its food. Now we're doing this to be as, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah. I may, I accidentally unplugged it, so it may have impacted things. Sorry, Zoomers, one second. Did I find me have unplugged? Yep, I unplugged it. Not the All right. There we go. Yeah, I um, tripped the cord here. I get so excited talking about seals that like I move and I don't notice it and crazy. Okay, so um, the tubing means we're as hands off as possible and it's quick. It starts to get to the point, we'll do five of these a day for the little ones, it's five tubings, and they start to just swallow the tube. They know exactly what to do to get a full billy. Um, and so this is quick. It's the least invasive option. And when they're not feeling well, it's the quickest way to get them their fluids. Now I wanna show you some patients that have come in through the years. The one um, with the top picture, it's looking a little skinny. This is how it was when it came in. So this is our, this was the first pup that I responded to when I joined the response team. And I brought him in, he was number 191 of the year. He was very small, about 16 pounds. A healthy newborn seal pup should be 20 to 25 pounds. And then after a few months, he plumped right up. <laughs> Look at that healthy, happy seal on the bottom. He weighed 50 pounds. That's one of the benchmarks that we expect these animals to hit. They have to, they start on formula if they're dependent pups. We move them up to a delicious fish smoothie and then eventually chunks of fish fish, and then live fish. So they do have to show us that they can dive, that they can catch live fish, that they can be off medication for a couple of weeks, and then they have to hit 50 pounds. That means they are healthy enough and chubby enough and have that blubber to keep them warm in the cold ocean. It also gives them a little bit of a buffer if they lose a little bit of weight when they first get out there and relearning what to do. Um, they are still plump enough. The other picture with the stuffed animal is a seal that is at the center or that came in this year. Um, we give them stuffed animals because at this point, they're babies, they suckle. So this, they like to suckle on something and usually we give them a stuffed animal to do that or they start to suckle on each other 
we'll put some babies in together and it's just the cutest thing. Um, another special case was this one here. This was the oldest one. Gosh, this was in 2020. Oh gosh, I feel like this was just last year, but um, this seal was the oldest harbor seal we had come through the center. She was estimated at three or four years old based on her size. Uh, you can tell in the bottom picture there, she was not feeling well and had lost a lot of weight. Um, after a couple months at the center, she plumped right back up, gaining almost 100 pounds, and she was released back into the ocean. Now, usually when they're no longer dependent, they start to show their true uh, seal personalities. Once they start feeling better, they might get a little more spunky. And we're waiting for that. We're hoping to see that. We want them to be afraid of humans. We want them to be spunky. Um, this seal, we're waiting for her to feel better and see how spunky she got with her size. Uh, she was the sweetest, calmest seal I've ever experienced. And probably because she didn't really have a whole lot to fear at her size. Um, but she gave us a look into the behavior of adult seals that we don't get to see usually at the center because we're getting babies. So we got to see her look like a potato at the bottom of the pool taking a nap. Um, we got to see how they would take a nap if they were out to sea for weeks at a time. They just float at the top with their nose out of the water. So it was really neat to get to see her different behaviors. And then we are able to tag some of them. The tags usually cost between two and $4,000, so we can't tag every seal. But she got a satellite tag that every time she surfaces sends a ping and lets us know where she is. That These tags are not meant to last forever. They are glued to her fur and she does molt, so it's going to fall off eventually. But we got a little bit of time um, with her satellite tag and got to see how far down the coast she went. Um, and we try to tag one every summer to keep track of their life after release from rehabilitation. They also all, every single one of them, will get a back tail, uh, a back tail flipper um, tag. That flipper tag just has um, a number on it. So if it's ever found, it can be traced back to us and we can be alerted to uh, this animal, animal being found. And it was really cool. We had one photographed recently that was a seal that had been in our care 10 years ago. So it was really cool to see it thriving and doing well. Now I have just a few videos I'm going to show you of their behavior. They're really funny to watch. They're not very different from a dog. This is a harp seal and they love their snow. So when they're feeling better, they get a little pile of snow. You can see they do have finger bones in those flippers and claws. So she's digging in the snow here. Now, I couldn't get the sound to work out. This is just a gray seal screaming. And just imagine a little kid screaming and you pretty much got it down. Uh, they are very loud and boisterous. I love gray seals for that reason. Um, and she was really spunky. This is number eight a couple years ago. Uh, if we were two minutes late with her food, we heard all about it. It was like a... Ah, ah. <laughs> Now, this is a harp seal that was pretty shy, and we would hear her making noises, and we could never catch her what she was doing. This is what she was doing. She was so curious, trying to see the environment around her, figure out what's going on. And you can almost see right here, someone walks in the room, and she's like, nope, I'm not doing anything. So we had to set up a camera to capture this because we would hear her splash. And we would go in and she's like, well, oh, nothing, nothing to see here. But she was silly. They just have, they each have their own personality and it's so fun to learn each one of them. And now, as you can tell, like we're very hands off. This was a camera that we set up. So we're trying, we don't want them to be used to humans bringing them their food. Now I wanna show you this one really quickly. This is another juvenile harp seal that showed up a couple winters ago. He kept showing up on a busy beach and we brought him in just to make sure he's doing okay. All of his tests checked out. So we released him the next day. So this is him and I just wanna show you what they look like when they move on land. It's the best thing. That's a glump, glump, glump. Can't you hear it? Like glump, glump, glump. <laughs> They're really funny. So this one, you might see a green line on its back. That's non-toxic paint. We marked him. 
Um, just so we knew right away if he showed back up, if we got a call, is there green on this seal? <laughs> and if yes, then we knew. So we released him at a quiet beach and two days later he was back on the busy beach. We removed him from where he was growling at people. So um, he really liked that beach apparently. Stubborn little guy. So I just wanna show you a few ways that you can take action for marine mammals. Um, there's so many different things that you can do to help us out. We are a nonprofit that survives solely on donations and federal grant funding. We do not get any state funding at all. Um, so a few things you can do to help us out. Save our hotline number. Then you know exactly who to call if you stumble upon a seal or anything on the beach. Uh, and again, live or dead, we want to know about it. Um, our Ocean Commotion 5K, it's our biggest fundraiser of the year. That's in October, I believe the 19th this year. It's in beautiful Hermit Island. It's a walk and fun run. It's such a fun day of different events and raffles and things like that. And you don't even have to run to come and have fun. Uh, so keep that in mind. If you like to be outdoors in October, it's a beautiful site. Uh, the Clink program, if you participate in that, you can select to donate um, your Clink uh, credits to Marine Mammals in Maine. You can follow us on social media to be aware of the work that we're doing. You'll see lots of amazing uh, SEAL updates. We'll, we update on all of our patients pretty regularly. We also, on our website, have an Amazon wish list. These are all items that we need to care for our animals that we have in-house right now. And right now we have six SEAL pups at the moment. Um, in this picture here, all those little arrows are pointing to things that had been donated through our Amazon wish list. So this is always a lifesaver every year. Uh, you can participate in cleanups. We participate with the Wells Beach cleanup every, it's usually around Earth Day every year. Um, this was from this past one. Participate in cleanups. We do see seals that, and other animals that are entangled in something every year. So helping with cleanups helps to prevent that um, with our these amazing animals. You can join our newsletter that is on our website as well, which is listed there. It's the mommy.org. Joining our newsletter, we send out a Friday video once a month. And that's really great. If you love SEAL videos, you will love this. Um, but there's lots of different ways to help. And I mentioned that our volunteer, Terry, is on here in Zoom. She was the one that rescued Sunshine, the SEAL, in Cape Elizabeth. And that inspired her to write a book. And so it's called The Seal Named Sunshine and I have a copy of it up here. This is through, um, you can get it through Amazon. This documents her journey rescuing Sunshine and Sunshine's journey through our rehabilitation program. And it's illustrated by Terry. It's a really lovely uh, book. And this is Terry and I releasing Sunshine when she was ready to go back into the ocean. So I want to thank you all so much for listening to all this stuff about seals. Uh, this is our website and our hotline number. I also have brochure stickers and uh, magnets on the table over there by your items. And then I brought a whale bone and a seal pelt. If you'd like to check those out afterwards, uh, feel free. But does anyone have any questions? I know I threw a lot at you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, go. Yeah, great question. So life expectancy of these animals and then population um, updates. So life expectancy can be anywhere towards 20 years. Um, that's kind of on the higher end. I'd say 12, 15 is a great life for a seal. Um, Population-wise, I don't know current numbers, but harbor seal populations are doing okay right now in the tens of thousands um, and are pretty uh, well balanced right now and maintained. Um, and there's been years where that dips due to like a disease. Um, they were susceptible to avian flu a couple of years ago and distemper years before that. So we see ups and downs in their population, but right now they're pretty stable in the tens of thousands is what I'm guessing. Um, don't put that in the paper or anything. <laughs> Not official quote. Any other questions? Mm -hmm.
Oh, where was the, the photo? So I'm repeating this for our Zoom friends here. So the seal that we got a picture of 10 years after we released it, it was in, uh, it was off the coast of Portland. So not too far. Yeah. It was on a rock laying there. They do something called banana pose where they like curl up their back flippers and they look like a banana. It was banana pose. That's a good sign for a seal. And it was happy, healthy, chunky, just what we like to see in a seal. But yeah, it was off the coast of Portland. Yes. Yes, Bill. Great question. I think for harbor seals, it's pretty random. We don't see as many harbor seals in the winter as we do the summer. Of course, they're having their babies right now. Um, but they do tend to shift a little bit southwards, but not too far, like Massachusetts. But we're still going to see them here, just maybe not in the numbers that we want. Uh, so they might go a little bit south. Same with the harp seals, they're gonna come down here. This is kind of their, it was their southernmost range in the winter, but now we're seeing them go a little bit more south each year. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of, I think, pretty random for the harbor seals. Oh, so what kind of injuries are we seeing? So we might see, um, right now we're about to see what we call weanling mouth. That is baby seals that have weaned from mom learning how to eat fish. And there's a little bit of a learning curve where they have to learn to turn the fish and then they, they don't chew, they suck it right down. They're like little hoovers. <laughs> um, so they have to learn to turn the fish. And as they're learning that, you're gonna see scratches along the mouth from the fish. So uh, we had a pup that came in that had a little bit of a swollen muzzle and scratched up, but she was trying to learn how to fish. So it's a rough transition. And as with any wildlife, mortality is high in their first year. Um, so they, the ones that figure it out though, you know, smooth sailing, but we're gonna see that a little bit more right now. Um, we might see uh, hit by boat propellers, uh, entanglements, um, shark bites, and that's not anything that's changed historically. That's always been the case. Um, it might just be a scratch from a rock. Sometimes we don't know the the reasoning behind the injuries. We can't always pinpoint each one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So as um climate change is happening? Is anyone keeping an eye um, out for changes as food changes and things? Uh, yes, there are scientists that are keeping a close eye. And, you know, our data that we collect is going to help predict different trends. Um, but seals are a keystone species. We are going to see them have to make some adjustments. And so we're going to learn a lot from their behavior and how that changes. So maybe that means their range is different now or they go elsewhere for food, things like that. Or we're gonna see some Arctic species either come down further, or maybe if there's not a lot of ice one year, then there might not be a lot of Arctic seals that are coming down if they don't survive um, being born on the ice. Uh, so we're, it's, it's hard to know what is gonna happen, but it's definitely something lots of scientists are keeping a close eye on the behavior change and how they will adapt. Yes. Harp seals, usually um, March, April is when harp seals are heading home. Uh, we were even releasing some harp seals towards the end of March. So that's usually the time frame that they um, head out. They're usually here. I think we had one in December. That was our first one this winter. But usually January, February is when we're going to start to see them. They're just here for a couple of months. Great questions. Awesome. Oh, I see you back there. Yeah, great question. What is our success rate in terms of rehabbing? I don't have a number for you. Um, I will say it changes every year. And as much as we try to save every animal, that's impossible. So we are going to experience loss as hard as we try not to. 
um, but I don't have a percentage for you, but I will tell you this statistic this year that um, we have already, by April, we had already released the number of seals that we would normally release in a year by April this year. So we've had more come through this year. Um, and a lot of that is too, we've expanded to the number we can take in. So we're gonna see a shift because of that. Uh, but we've already released uh, 15 or 16 seals and that's usually what we do in a year. And there will be more <laughs> now that the pups are around. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you all so much. And I'll stick around for a minute if you have other questions or want to check out the things here. Um, Zoom people, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. But otherwise, I just thank you so much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night.